Our next presenter is Dr. Michael Hunt. He is a clinical biomechanist, and uh, he introduced me to his lab a few months ago. It's really, really neat. Puts all sorts of stuff on the body and then measures what direction people move and so on. And I've never seen anything like it before, but he's come up with some really interesting results, which he's obviously going to tell us about. His work involves understanding how injuries and diseases like arthritis impact how people move. Today, he will be speaking about all things in the way of assistive devices like canes, orthotics, footwear, and more activity modifications. Please welcome Dr. Michael Hunt. Thanks, Thanks very much, John. Um, and thank you also to uh, Arthritis Research Canada and APAB. I think this is probably the third or fourth uh, ROAR event that I've spoken at. I really enjoy it. So thanks for the invite back. Um, so just a couple slides just to kind of get the ball rolling. So looking at these two pictures, which one do we think is better? And I, I use that term relatively loosely. Um, the way that I would look at it, which, which, which one do we think is less harmful to the body? So we've got one here on the left and one on the right. How, quick show of hands, how many think the one on the left is more harmful to the body? Okay, perfect. Same question. One, we've got one guy lifting up five people and we've got another one where we've got a nice pyramid. Which one do we think is, is, is better? So less harmful, let's think more harmful to the body. The one on the left or the one on the right? More harmful on the left. Perfect, okay. And just to mix things up a bit, we've got two shipping containers here. <laughs> and based on the, uh, the, the laughter, I'm assuming that everyone's going to assume that uh, the one on the left is, is more harmful. So the, the underlying commonality here is, is load. And so that's, as John mentioned, that's kind of the world that I live in. That's the, the lab that I have out at UBC Hospital. We measure loads and forces and how that impacts the body. We know that joint loading and the loads that, that go through our, our tissues um, is an important consideration in, in health. And really what the, the issue with the, the slides that I had is the size of the load and the distribution of the load. So thinking back to the first picture, we had an individual who had a very large backpack, very large load through the body. In the other two pictures, we had something that was either well distributed or unequally distributed. So that, again, that's kind of the world that I live in. And we know that that human cartilage and other tissues respond to the loads placed on them. There, we're always in a state of flux where we have damage to tissues and then repair, damage to tissues and then repair. Problems occur when the body is unable to keep up with that and the, the damage occurs at a faster rate or a larger rate than the repair. So things like we could have poor repair mechanisms. So one example I always give is smoking. We know smoking is bad for our lungs, but we also know that smoking is bad for repairing our tissues. And so if you're a smoker, you're at a much greater increased risk of having some of these issues related to tissues breaking down. We could also have genetic susceptibility. Poor overall health, again, would, would have an impact on how well we're able to repair this damage. And as, as I said, from a mechanical perspective, the, the, the work that I do, when loads are too big or when they're poorly distributed, doesn't matter whether it's a shipping container or cartilage or muscle or whatever, the principles are exactly the same. So when I talk about faulty loads, again, I talk about loads that are high in magnitude, they're big, or they're poorly distributed. So again, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the body or a bridge or a building, we want to make sure that, that the load is nice and equally distributed as much as possible. There's a lot of research out there that would suggest that some of these faulty loads, again, whether we're talking about big loads or, or poorly distributed loads, are strong risk factors for the progression of osteoarthritis, specifically at the knee. Um, there's studies out there that would show that if you bring people back, you know, five, six years later, look at their x-rays, those who have higher loads passing through their joint will have worse x-rays at that follow-up. If you get an MRI of your, your ankle or your knee or your hip, and if you are experiencing higher loads, you will exhibit more cartilage loss on, and the volume is worse. So again, an indicative of worsening disease symptoms. And from a clinical perspective, those who have higher loads tend to be at a greater risk 
for progressing to get joint replacement surgery. So again, from a disease and, and a clinical perspective, um, these loads tend to be uh, very important to look at. So when we move, every time we're moving around, we load our joints. And every step we take, a load of about one to two times our body weight passes through our knee joint, okay? So every single step we take, we're loading our joints. And as I mentioned earlier, loading is, is certainly important from a, a repair perspective, but it could also be important from a damage perspective as well. Using some of the techniques that we've got in my lab and other labs around the world, we've measured the fact that every time we take a step, about 85% of that load passes through the inner half or the inside part of the knee. And so going back to that question earlier about what is a partial knee replacement, when I think of the knee joint, I think of probably four, I can bisect it into four components. So you've got the femur, which is your thigh bone, okay? And you've got the tibia, which is your shin bone. And so they um, articulate or they, they meet each other. And then you've got the inside part of your joint and you've got the outside part of your joint. So what a, a total joint replacement would do would basically replace all of the femur at, at the end and all of the end of the tibia. So it would be a total replacement. A partial replacement would be only replacing the femur or only replacing the tibia part, or it could be you're only replacing the inside part of your knee or only replacing the outside part of your knee. So that would be a partial. Sometimes you call it a unicompartmental, or you might hear it called a uni. Um, so just taking some time to, perfect, thank you. Um, we also know that because the loads are, are more prevalent, again, on the inside part of the knee, more people who have knee arthritis tend to report pain on the inside part of the knee. So again, showing that there's a bit of a link between these loads that are placed on the joint and feelings such as pain and dysfunction. And factors such as limb, limb malalignment, so if someone is really bow-legged, we've done some measurements and we found that up to, up, sometimes up to 100% of that load passes through that inside part of the joint. So again, this would be a situation where I'm talking about a poorly distributed load because all of it is on that inside part of the joint. So this is, this is usually about the time where I start getting in trouble because um, it's a bit, a bit of a catch-22. So people would say, I've been told to be more active or I've been told to exercise and exercise is good for me. But then I just told you that when I load when I move, I load my joints, and so the theory that would be is, is exercise and activity, isn't that bad for you? So full stop right now, no, exercise and activity are not bad for you. There's a number of other factors that are related to exercise and activity, cardiovascular health, anti-inflammatory health, things like that. So I would, I would never tell someone not, to, not to, uh, to be active and to exercise. All I'm saying is that sometimes when there are larger loads, that might put someone at an increased risk of progressing, okay? So the work that I do is to try to get the best of both worlds. And so I, I do research into what are called biomechanical treatments, and those that are, are treatments that specifically target those loads and try to either redistribute them or reduce the magnitude of the load. And really what we're trying to do is we're allowing people to be more active, to exercise more in, a, in, a, in the presence of lower loads or you know, getting the best of both worlds. So, title of the talk was canes, orthotics, and footwear. So um, I just want to go through each one um, individually. So canes, um, I saw a, a gentleman using a cane earlier, which was fantastic. Um, so how do they work? They act to unload or reduce the magnitude or the size of that load um, through the nip, or the, sorry, the, the hip and the knee or the ankle joint by taking body weight through the arm and through the cane. So in essence, you're, you're offloading um, what would normally go through your leg. And obviously, the more weight that you can push through that cane, the more weight that you can take up the, through your arm, the less weight that goes through your legs. So that's, that's the theory behind it. Um, in terms of, of proper use, um, it should always be held in the opposite hand to the problematic side. And I know that some people tend to get a bit confused about this. My, my approach is always when we walk, we walk with our opposite hand, opposite arm, right? Just from a, 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 an ease and a reciprocal side. So it should always be held in the opposite hand to the, to the worsened side. Um, in terms of how the, the cane should be set up, if you stand with your arms down at your side and if you look at your wrist, you can see where your wrist crease is, the handle of the cane should be at approximately the height of your wrist crease. Just, again, it's, it's for ease of use. It also helps to reduce some issues related to elbow and, and shoulder pain. And of course, to actually have it working properly, you should be taking weight through that cane for the duration of time that your foot's in contact with the ground. I see a lot of people out there, they'll walk along with the cane and you know, every so often they might kind of tap the ground with it, not doing a lot of, uh, a lot of help. 
So in terms of pros, obviously you can unload a painful and, and faulty loaded joint, and we've done some research that has shown that you know, take, depending on how much weight you take through the, uh, the arm and the shoulder, you can reduce the magnitude or the size of that load through your knee joint by about 20%. Um, another good thing about canes is it can help with balance. It's, it's a stability aid as well as, a, as an unloading aid. Some of the cons, um, it's an additional device, device that requires attention. And what I mean by that is you have to remember to use it. Lots of times people will say, hey, where's your cane? Oh, I forgot it at home. Or I forgot it in the car, or I, whatever, right? So it's, it's a thing that just needs to be um, a, a, ten, a tension uh, aspect. Theoretically, if you put more uh, weight uh, through the, the wrist and the hand, um, you might run into some hand and wrist problems. And then lastly, aesthetics. And so I, I hate seeing these um, signs because only old and frail people use canes, according to that, a sign like that, which is, of course, not the case. Okay? Um, orthotics. So orthotics are, are uh, devices that are worn in your shoes. And how they work is by cushioning under the foot, so they're taking up some of that load um, as we walk, or realigning the limb, depending on the design. And there's really three main types of orthotics. One is your, your typical shock-absorbing insole, and you would find these, your, you know, your Dr. Scholl's, they have gel in them usually, you get them at the, at the pharmacy. Really, they're there to act as a cushion to help kind of unload that joint. You can get a custom-made orthotic, and so this would be where you would go to a, a clinic and they would take a, a mold of your foot or they would scan your foot and then kind of build it up to, to go underneath your foot. Um, it's really good to kind of realign um, the bones and whatnot. There's also a thing called the lateral wedge insole, which not many people are aware of, but it's, it's really common for NEOA treatment and literally all it is, is it's a kind of a flat insole, but it's built up on the outside part. And the goal there is to realign the lower limb to help redistribute those loads. And again, we've done a number of, of research studies showing that they are quite effective, not only in redistributing those loads, but also improving pain and function. So it's just, just an option. Um, so pros can unload, unload a painful and faulty loaded joint. I like it because there's no additional effort or attention needed. You literally put them in your shoes and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. Um, and they're really highly available, especially the shock-absorbing insoles. You can literally walk into Shoppers Drug Mart or wherever today and go get a pair of, of, of gel insoles, and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, cons are a cost. If you are going to get one of those custom-fitted ones, they could run upwards of you know five or six hundred dollars, and then you always have to, especially with the custom-fitted ones, um, figure out what's going on with uh, with the foot or the ankle joint. Um, and then in terms of footwear. Um, alterations, depending on what type of footwear you're using, can certainly affect the loads that are passing through your joint. I always give the example of high-heeled shoes versus a pair of running sneakers. And I say, you know, which one do you think is more cushioning? And most people would, would agree that the, the, the sneakers are, are more cushioning, and that's what they're designed for, is to, is to unload that lower limb. So a, a more cushioning or a thicker heel is certainly preferred. I usually say high heels are not desirable, at least biomechanically. I think, you know, I'm looking at Dr. Devere and she has some really fancy high heels today and they're very nice to look at, but biomechanically they might not be uh, the best. <laughs> but I'm certainly not gonna tell her to, uh, to, to, to do that. Um, and you're looking for something with a nice supportive heel structure to, again, to improve that stability. And then lastly, it wasn't in the title because it would have been too long. A lot of the work that we do is gait modification and, and really this, just simply changing the way we walk to improve um, what's going on inside our joints. So we can make very subtle changes to the way we walk and how we walk, which will have some major improvements in terms of what's going on with the loading. Um, common approaches, walking slower. Obviously, the slower you walk, the, the lower the, the loads. I'm not a huge fan of that because then there's issues with, with functionality and whatnot. Um, something as simple as walking with your feet wider apart. We've shown that it's an effective way of redistributing those loads or walking with your toes pointed out or pointed in. I know that sounds very simple, but we've, we've, seen, we've done a number of studies by literally telling people, walk with your toes pointed out, walk with your toes pointed in, and we've seen some pretty, um, pretty great results. So in terms of pros, again, can unload a painful or faulty loaded joint. I would say minimal, if not no cost. So walk with your toes pointed out. There you go, free advice, didn't cost a thing. Um, doesn't require any additional resources. We had one study participant who took, got a piece of tape and uh, cut it into the shape of an arrow and put it on his shoe. And that was his cue. It was fantastic. It was his cue to kind of say every so often he'd look down, oh, my, it's pointing ahead. I need to remember to do that. So for him, three cents worth of tape. Okay. Cons might be difficult because you're relearning how to walk. Again, we don't want to make these changes too big. Um, it's not in, it's Dr. Dr. Bansbeck talked a lot about how 
the research and things like joint replacement have been around for 30, 40, 50 years. This is still in its relative infancy, and we're always worried about effects on other joints. So just to, to summarize take-home message, um, I think that re reducing, uh, lowering, and redistributing joint loads um, are one aspect, not, it's not a be-all and end-all, it's, it's one aspect of, of overall clinical management um, of OA. It should be done in conjunction with, with other types of treatment strategies. Um, I think it allows you to be more active to exercise in a more quote-unquote biomechanically favorable way, i.e. good loads, not faulty loads. Um, we've shown that simple changes can produce large effects and, you know, to the point where we've seen benefits um, that would mirror drugs, surgery, interventions, things like that. Um, we talked about Kane's footwear, foot modifications, movement modifications. And I think the, the really the important thing here is it's an option, right? It's something that you might want to try. It's, it's a trial and error. Um, everything's not going to work for everybody, so it's just kind of seeing what works best for you. But it's, it's new options that, uh, that might be beneficial. Walking poles versus canes, yeah, please. Yeah, I knew I, I, knew I was going to get that question. So the question was walking poles. Um, the research would tell us that they don't do what they're intended to do. And, and so if we look at the canes, canes unload the, lo the lower limb, right? And there have been a number of studies that show with the walking poles, they actually increase the loads through the lower limb. My, my personal belief is that people use them quite differently. Canes, you will use you know, pushing straight down and will help to unload the, the lower leg. Um, a walking or a walking pole or urban pole is really to get out there and to be active and so you're, you're using it in slightly different ways. I don't mean that in a negative way. I would always tell someone if you need the, the urban poles or whatever to be more active and to get out and do it, by all means do it. And that's why I'm saying these loads are, I think they're important, but they're not the be all and end all. So if, if urban poles work, fantastic. They get people out moving for sure. Uh, I've got two questions from online. Um, the first one being hiking and early OA. Is yep. it good or bad? Uh, this question was hiking and early OA. The easy answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> we're actually doing a lot of work right now looking at running and OA. Um, and there's really no evidence to suggest that running causes or doesn't cause OA. Again, going back to my, to my earlier comment, I think there's a lot of benefits from hiking and running and things like that on cardiovascular health, body weight, things like that. And if it's something that someone enjoys, I would never tell them to stop doing it. So I think that, I think the jury is, is certainly still out on that. Okay, and uh, second question is, if most pain is on the inner half of the knee, what causes the pain on the outside of the knee? Yeah, so there's, there's a good question. So. There could be a number of factors. There's lots of soft tissues on the outside part of the knee. So typically, arthritis does not happen in isolation. We now think of osteoarthritis as being a disease of the whole joint, not just the cartilage. So it could be muscles that are causing the pain. It could be ligaments. It could be any number of things that are causing that pain. Hi, Michael. Thanks for coming. Um, what's your opinion on the pros and cons of unloader braces? Knee braces. Yeah, so I knew I was going to get that question as well. Um, it depends on what you're using them for. And what I mean by that is um, I think they're good to provide stability, for sure. I think they're good to act as, no pun intended, a crutch to get someone back. Um, so I, I, I had a knee injury about 20 years ago, um, and I had, just had a really unstable knee joint. And I was not then not physically active because I knew I had an unstable joint. I got a knee brace, which gave me a psychological boost to then get back um, into being more active. I was not going to use it all the time because there are certainly some negative benefits um, of wearing a brace. I think a lot of people don't like wearing braces, again, from an aesthetic perspective because they've got these big bulky things that sometimes they have to wear outside of their pants. Um, but I would say that if it's going to allow you to be more active and it's going to allow you to have a, a joint that's stable, it's something that I would certainly consider. 